Hello again, I am Blunty, and as promised in my full in-depth review, here is my 100% gaming-focused look at the new Apple TV. Now then, the pure gaming performance of this beastie can be expected to be near identical to that from the latest iPhones and iPads, as the Apple TV shares exactly the same Apple-designed A8 CPU as its iOS cousins. And as the reviews of those products have already revealed when they were launched, the A8 is a bit of a monster in its own right, and quite a capable beating heart for what Apple like to call console-quality gaming experiences. So I'm not going to dwell on performance much here. It's pretty much a known quantity. The unknown quantity here is of course the user interface, the controller, in this case, the Siri remote. A few buttons, a touchpad, and a little slender thing. It is the standard input device for the Apple TV. It's what comes in every single box, and Apple have dictated to developers that all apps, including games, must be fully functional with just the remote. Developers are free, of course, to take full advantage of the MFI-compatible traditional game controller support that's existed within iOS for a while now, and of course it also lives here in tvOS, but it is not permitted as the only control method. So what we need to look at here is how well games work with this unusual controller, and to do this I'm going to kind of kick through a whole bunch of mini-reviews of a range of different types of games with different styles of gameplay, and I'll be mainly chatting about the different ways they're using the remote for their input, and, you know, if it actually works properly. The App Store is brand new, the selection is small but growing every single day, and what I've got here is a mix of stuff I'm familiar with from other platforms, some stuff I'm not familiar with, some stuff inspired by classic arcade games, and some stuff that was made for iOS from the ground up, so it should give us a pretty good idea about what the game developers are up to. I want to start with one of the games I specifically called out by name in my main review of the Apple TV, as having done a superb job of adapting to the remote. Rayman Adventures. The game franchise itself has a well-established reputation as not only being lovely to look at and wonderfully animated, but also gameplay that feels smooth and highly flowy. And to my great surprise and delight, the way they've integrated the remote into the gameplay here is nothing short of delightful. With nothing more than directional swipes and a tap to jump, they've managed to bring a full range of platforming navigation and combat mechanics into one of the most elegant and intuitive control schemes I've ever experienced. It's fun, it's responsive, and so natural feeling it quickly becomes near instinctive. It helps that the gameplay itself is delightful, but without controls that work as well as this, that delight would dissolve into frustration very rapidly indeed. This game can be held up as an example to all about how well the Siri remote can actually work so long as the developer puts some real thought into how to use it on its own strengths instead of just trying to get it to emulate more traditional game controls. Lumio City, a similarly stunningly pretty game with a visual aesthetic that is as charming as it is clever. It is, sadly though, on the other side of the coin to Rayman. This game is already an award-winning puzzle adventure game on iOS, and the reviews of the iOS version are filled with gushing praise for it. And it is the same game here, but instead of touch screen controls, they've replaced your prodding finger with a mouse-like on-screen cursor, which is somewhat awkwardly shifted around the place using the touchpad. Unfortunately, it's much more like moving a cursor around with an analog thumbstick on a traditional game controller rather than the laptop touchpad inspired experience you may have hoped for. It feels slow and clumsy and frankly the ever-present little white dot on the screen rather distracts from the otherwise beautiful presentation of this game. From the ground up, this game was designed and built with a touchscreen in mind, and now with a sloppy mouse cursor controlled by your thumb on a tiny little touchpad, gameplay feels rather graceless. It's a tremendous shame. Galaxy on Fire 3 Manticore Rising, a wave-based, arcadey-feeling 3D space dogfighting shoot-'em-up. It's another game with impressive and delightful visuals, and while I've not experienced the previous Galaxy on Fire games at all, this is a game type I'm quite familiar with, and frankly, I'd expected it to be a complete disaster with the Syria remote, especially when the control tips came up on screen and I saw it was motion-controlled flight. You guys who watch me on a regular basis know I'm, I'm not a fan of what I call waggle mechanics. 
However, I was gleefully wrong. It actually feels wonderful to control. It only requires small movements, so there's no flicking or waggling or flinging or, you know, twisting your wrists around each other just to try and control the ship. But at the same time, it feels precise, responsive and natural. Swipes on the thumb pad trigger boosts and breaks and rolls depending on the direction, and firing is simply automatic once you've maneuvered an enemy craft into your crosshairs, with a click of the pad triggering any special power-up you've collected. Maybe it all sounds a bit dumbed down and dummy mode stuff when it's described like that, but once you're playing, it just works, and more importantly, it's fun. Battle Evolution brings us back into a world of utter misery, frustration and bewilderment about how anyone presumably proud of their game would allow it into public with a control scheme this aggressively player abusive. They want you to hold the remote like a flight stick, meanwhile showing an icon on screen of exactly the wrong way to hold a flight stick. And in fact, if you do hold it this way, it will not work at all with the rest of the controls they expect you to use simultaneously. You control a tank by pretending the remote's an old joystick, attached to not a nice solid base, to provide a sense of registration and context to your movement, but to thin air with no tactile feedback at all. This thin air joystick thing has never worked. Ever. We know this already. People have tried it. It doesn't work. It's crap. But then, while doing this, your thumb is expected to use the touchpad to move around a targeting reticule, which whips about the screen clumsily, and which itself lags behind your actual movements. The controls for the flight sections are almost as bad. Swiping to try and find a target, while a presumably heroin-addicted autopilot careens you in every direction that isn't pointed at your enemies. A control scheme that includes asking you to constantly shake the remote like an epileptic under a strobe light just to keep your shields up. It's catastrophic. It's unplayable. It's idiotic garbage. Think of the most awkwardly, stupidly controlling Nintendo Wii game you ever played. The game that made you want to deliberately throw the remote through your television. Yeah, this is like that. But at the halfway mark of functionality between this disaster and the glorious joy of Manticore comes Disney Infinity. And while it shares the title and visual aesthetic of its namesakes, in reality it's barely more than a minigame teaser for the real Disney Infinity games on consoles. Consider it little more than a playable advertisement. It's a demo more than it is a proper game. But at least it's free. Its space combat is tied to the plane of the Death Star. Controllers with a horizontally held remote using the motion sensors to guide your movement, the play button under your right thumb for firing weapons, and either swiping or tapping on the thumb pad to trigger rolls and loops and banking maneuvers. It is less elegant and more complicated than Manticore Rising's approach to much the same ends, but it also feels significantly mushier, less responsive, more floaty. Some of that is due to the game being largely on rails. You don't so much pilot freely as you are making minor attitude adjustments for targeting and avoiding attacks while flying along a preset flight path. It is a fun little demo though, with the typical visual charm of the series. Aussie developers Halfbrick have thrown up a version of their popular game Machine Gun Jetpack, currently with Back to the Future cross-branding theming pasted all over it. I used to love this game, once upon a time, but then Halfbrick discovered what microtransactions were and started filling this and all their other games with that bullshit. And in doing so, they completely lost all of their charm for me. On mobile, it's a simple tap to jump auto runner obstacle course thingy, and it's the exact same game here, only you tap the touchpad instead of a touch screen. Obviously, this game, and the approximately 32.8 bazillion tap-based games like it, will port across almost unchanged and work just fine. Like Alto's Adventure, for example, it is much the same deal, pretty much directly squirted across from a screen-tapping game to a remote-tapping game, but unlike Machine Gun Jetpack, which gains nothing of interest from being on the Apple TV instead of a mobile device, Alto's stunningly gorgeous aesthetic looks utterly magnificent on the big screen. I really wish there was more to tell you about this game, because the longer I talk, the more of it I can show you, and I'm just in love with its elegant splendor and addictive gameplay. 
but it is just a screen tap game turned into a touch tap game, so there's not much else I can say about it, except you should own it. It's one of the very best examples of this type of game I have ever experienced on any platform. It's just lovely. Another simple and popular game making its unsurprising appearance on the Apple TV is Crossy Road, a game which is basically just a Frogger ripoff mated with an endless runner. But it was popular enough to have inspired about 36.2 gajillion sleazy knockoffs from uninspired hacks calling themselves developers. Anyway, here it's, well, it's a bit of a sludgy disappointment. Directional movement is achieved by swipes on the pad, which unfortunately feels laggy imprecise, sloppy, and for a game like this where precision means life or death, that's rather a problem. Now, I never actually played the mobile version of this game, so I don't really know if this kind of vague feeling control scheme is supposed to be part of the challenge. All I know is I don't like it. And I also know I have absolutely played far better Frogger clones in my day. But speaking of games inspired by a trip in a time machine to the classic days of proper arcades and consoles that took cartridges, here comes Phoenix HD. A vertical shooter bullet hell, which on a standard vertically orientated screen of a mobile phone, fits rather nicely with a game copycatting arcade games that actually had their screens mounted vertically. But here, on horizontal widescreen TVs, they've gone the rather lazy route of just window boxing it between gorge and blurs. Which I suppose is nicer than black bars, but it still feels lazy. The good news is, though, that the thumb pad sliding control scheme tied to the auto firing weapons actually makes for a surprisingly playable experience. It takes a bit to really get a good feel for the controls and the momentum in play, but once you get dialed in, it feels nicely precise, actually. A bit more floaty than the arcade stick, of course, or even D-pad, that I'm more accustomed to for this style of game, but floaty doesn't feel sloppy, and I do feel like I'm in proper control, and any hit I take is genuinely my fault, not the game's. It is a bit visually overcrowded with effects than I usually like this type of vertical bullet swarm shooter to be. The flashy lighting looks, well, flashy, but I'd rather it be dialed back a bit so it's easy to actually see what's going on. But the game mechanics are pretty solid, and that's another one in the pile of pleasant surprises. I never expected this type of game to work this well with a swipey touchpaddy thing. Now, wanting something to test out a more Nintendo Wii-like swinging motion control scheme, I installed Hit Tennis 3 which, aside from being one of the most laughably terrible tennis games I've ever had the misfortune to encounter, its motion control was equally as poor. It didn't seem to actually care which direction, or how hard, or how far, or any other variable of my actual swinging motion, and I felt like I had little to no actual control of the ball. So, as a way to test motion controls, it was pointless. It only gets a mention here, so none of you are foolish enough to download this pile of crap. And while we're at it, here is another steaming turd. Par 72 Golf 3. Without a doubt, the most abusively horrible golf game in the entire universe. Perhaps even the multiverse. That slideshow you're seeing there? Yeah, that's me just changing the angle of my shot. The game operates on swipes and taps, which work pretty much as you'd expect. But again, I'm only mentioning this game at all so you can actively avoid it. Lumo's Cat is a co-op focused kinda sorta tower defense game thingy. The developer was so on the ball that I was emailed a code to try this game within a couple of hours of my first video about the Apple TV going up. The only game in this video I got a freebie code for just for the record. The game itself is, well, it's not really my cup of tea unfortunately. The visual style is kind of delightful, if a little overwhelming, and the control scheme isn't what I'd call perfected. I'd bet this game would be much more fun with a proper controller, and a real life co-op partner, not the CPU controlled one I was recording with here for that matter, but this video is about control schemes on the remote, and here, the movement of your character is via sliding over the touchpad, a few other games we've talked about so far do that, you know, kind of like a D-pad, and it works okay. Unfortunately, the touchpad is also used for the attack move by tapping in a specific direction. So moving and attacking cannot be simultaneous and it makes the whole thing just kind of massively awkward. But this game is an example of multiplayer achieved by downloading a free app to your phone and turning it into a second controller, which is an elegant solution to the issue of having to buy extra controllers just for a simple little party game. 
Dungeon Quest Next, a free-to-play action RPG, which sounds nice, and I really dig the look of it too. It's a really cute balance of old school and new school. Unfortunately, it's rather ruined by the awful menus, and the terrible interface, and also the flood of crappy microtransaction rubbish, and the on-screen overlays that are scaled to suit a small screen which on a big TV look enormous, clumsy, and utterly in the way. They haven't even bothered to make the inventory screen even remotely usable without the touchscreen it was clearly designed for in the first place. But the very worst crime against game manity is the idiotic control scheme. Touchpad to move around. No worries, that works fine. Tap to fire your main attack. Yeah, that's okay. But with a game designed for three other button inputs, which on the phone are those awful on-screen affairs, and on a real gamepad would be ABXY, here though, they're replaced by flicking the remote in a direction. That's right, you tilt the remote left or right or up as button inputs. It's miserable! A bumbling, unwieldy mess, and to make matters worse, they screwed up the calibration and sensitivity so much I am forever, forever accidentally triggering their wrong commands or simply failing to activate the skill I'm trying to do. More's the pity, because buried underneath the clutter of lazy, graceless interfaces and grubby microtransaction crap and the paralytically cumbersome controls, there might have been a fun, if shallow feeling, action RPG buried in here somewhere. Maybe I'll give it another go with a proper gamepad when I get one, but as a game under the influence of the Siri remote, don't even bother. It's a disaster. Now, Ashfold 8. This is actually one of my go-to games for testing gaming performance on various iOS and Android devices. Firstly, because at its core it's a fun arcade racer. Secondly, because it's visually a bit sexy. But as much as I've used it for demos, I don't actually sit down and really play it much at all, mainly because of the crappy Mitra transaction BS that it's built around. But as a demo game, I really like it. So out of all the games I've been playing on the Apple TV, this one is the one I'm most familiar with, and indeed the one I have played on the widest amount of other devices. On the phones, it's a combo of tilt to steer and tap on either the left or right side of the screen to trigger Nitro or engage the brakes, and that works okay. Here though, you're asked to hold the remote sideways, using it like a teeny tiny race wheel, and a tap on the touchpad triggers the brake, and with your right thumb resting pretty naturally over the play button, a press there kicks in the nitro boost. And as much as I've historically loathed Wiimote-style motion-controlled steering, which for me has always felt floaty and sloppy and inaccurate, and its complete lack of any kind of tactile feedback, the Siri remote actually works really well here. In fact, beyond just being merely acceptable, I actually really, honestly, truly like it. It feels highly responsive without feeling twitchy, and smooth without feeling mushy. The clicky feel of the D-pad and the button make braking and boosting feel just tactile enough. This is the very first time in my life I think I've been perfectly okay with motion-controlled steering in a racing game. I feel like I'm properly in control for the first time ever. It's wonderful. The remote still feels too small on my big man paws, but not so much that it's distracting. <laughs> and on that note, I wonder how long it will be until someone puts out one of those ridiculous snap-on plastic steering wheel frame attachment thingies for it. <laughs> Quick, someone check Kickstarter or Thingverse for a 3D printed one. I bet you someone's working on one right now. But finally, a little turbulence. Looking quite a lot like it's leaked through an interdimensional rift where, in an alternate reality, the Game Boy Advance never had a colour screen, its retro charm sweetens what is actually a very compelling 8-bit style wave-based side-scroller. It's simple, it's elegant, and rather vitally, it's compellingly fun. Swiping around on the thumbpad to guide a little cloud around on a mission to absorb other clouds in order to grow big enough to destroy bigger targets and rack up high scores. And much like Phoenix HD, this style of game, traditionally more at home with a digital arcade stick or indeed a D-pad, here it feels more floaty, more inertia and acceleration based, but still it somehow maintains a sense of precision. Weaving about with swipes feels natural and fun. And again, I find myself surprised. I've spent decades playing side-scroller type games with joysticks and D-pads, and I never expected touchpad-style interface for one of these things to be even remotely as fun as a proper joystick. But it is. This game is really fun, and it works well. It feels natural. It's wonderful. 
I guess the take home message here is this. The Siri remote can actually be a very good game controller. It is no replacement for a traditional proper gamepad, and how well it works can vary wildly depending heavily not only on the type of game, but the skill and ingenuity of the game developer. But the hardware itself is certainly very capable of providing a compelling and gratifying level and style of control for many different game experiences. The touchpad brings with it all the responsiveness and pleasant tactility of its Big Brother trackpads living on MacBooks. The buttons have a nice click and feel of their own. The motion sensors are superbly sensitive, with the system clever enough to stop them feeling dull or jittery. And aside from feeling a bit small, the high quality materials the remote is built with feel very pleasant to have in hand for the extended periods gaming demands of it. So, as an out-of-box experience, without the benefit of a dedicated gaming controller, the Apple TV certainly has strong potential to become a compellingly capable micro-console. As you can tell, I was certainly surprised by how capable a gaming machine the Apple TV can be, so yeah, don't write it off. Things are only going to get better from here on in as more and more developers figure out more interesting ways to use the remote. But meanwhile, thanks for watching. I am Blunty, and I will catch you next time.